Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the exhibition Love in Exile, which I think comprises around 24 recent works, yeah. um, which are arranged on two floors in the Mallet Gallery. So um, after the talk, I would encourage you to have a good look around upstairs and then go downstairs as well, because together, or collectively, the paintings do form a kind of narrative journey. So what you see in this exhibition, some of you will be familiar with Heinrich's work. Um, it often involves the idea of the figure and the idea of the portrait. But these works, I understand, are much larger in scale. They involve the figure, but the figures, as you look around the room, you will see single figures, head studies, groups of figures in poses which can be variously described as ecstatic, agonised, athletic. They're in extremes from positions. And um, the idea is that these, um, this movement and the intertwining of these figures is sort of interrupted through the artistic process. So any suggestion of elegance and beauty is somehow violated um, with the sort of, you know, the interaction of different sort of um, techniques and methods. So on this side you will see burns. The canvas has been burned. On, on this, behind us here we see the use of solvents to dissolve the, and disintegrate the figures. And here we have this sort of smooth, almost neoclassical technique, um, sort of um, disrupted by the idea of um, adding paint in a very spontaneous, textured, gestural um, um, a manner. So the whole way of painting the, or producing these pictures is highly spontaneous and formative, as being very carefully premeditated as well. On the floor, I mentioned this idea of a narrative on the two floors. So if you go downstairs, the exhibition starts quite quietly. Take ourselves back to 2020, when we entered lockdown. There were small, a few small studies in gouache on paper, head studies. And these, Henrik Hansen, acts as a kind of visual diary. Something done very immediately and in an immediate, spontaneous manner. On the back, there are these notations about what you were thinking that day, what you were watching, what you were sort of eating. And these act as a kind of entree into the other paintings you see downstairs, which are painted on wood. So wood is the support, and they're painted on a white ground. And these show figures in movement. Um, they're painted so spontaneously, if there are two figures there, you can hardly distinguish one apart from the other, painted in a very expressive gestural manner. As you come upstairs, you'll see these paintings, which are different in that they are painted on canvas. Canvas is the support, and there's this sort of dark, sort of black background, and the figures seem to sort of you know, emerge or float around in a kind of vacuum. So the greater sense of, sort of suspense, slowness, here. Um, Heinrich has used the term action for downstairs and aftermath for the paintings upstairs. So that's perhaps something we can return to in the course of these, this discussion. So that just gives you a sort of general overview. I hope that um, makes sense. But some of you will be familiar with Heinrich's work, others won't be. So I think to start the discussion, let's try and contextualise your recent practice and um, perhaps open up the question about what brought you here, how you came to be an artist, how you came to be a painter. Perhaps talk about the two previous shows you did at the gallery, on um, sure. Lethe and Meta Neuer, mm. um, what the, the works stuff in those show, and how your work has really evolved in recent years. Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, what well, started out, I've always been making art, always been doing art, uh, didn't dive into the profession until I was maybe 19 years old after already quitting <laughs> because I thought I had nothing to do in, in the art realm. Came from a really small town in, in Norway and when they consolidated high schools I realized I'm not the greatest uh, painter there is. I'm actually not even top three in my class in a tiny little town. So I quit to uh, become a teacher. And whilst studying to become a teacher, I found oil painting for the first time and uh, fell in love with it and decided this is, this is where I want to be. So I've uh, been moving around for a couple of years and then ended up in London where I uh, now reside and work. So I understand you've been working around 15 years yeah, as, yeah. A, as, as a painter. Yeah. 
And then when you studied to be a teacher, that must have teach art, or was it craft? Uh, so absolutely everything. Everything, uh, everything. Yeah, I have a, a B in knitting. <laughs> we did absolutely everything. It was for, uh, for uh, students from six years till 16. So uh, a lot of babysitting, a lot of, um, you know, very basic crafts, but um, we got the time to do a little bit of everything, which has helped me later on. I've been, you know, getting to try some, some materials and techniques and printing, things that has, you know, found its way into my production to this day. Uh, but it was definitely not a formal art education. That seems, because you look at the paintings, you know, the, the emphasis on the figure and the face. There seems to be an understanding of something, anatomy, foreshortening, how you build up um, the composition in terms of layers. So that's something you picked up um, intuitively, or was it through sort of looking at other kinds of art? A uh, little bit of both. Uh, I didn't have a, a teacher telling me these kind of things, but I was always interested in concept art, um, gaming, movies, things that had certain compositional um, rules that I might not have found in, in, in galleries and museums, but I've definitely spent quite a few hours inside of museums and galleries as well in the early days. So uh, it's just picking up a little bit here and there finding information about paintings and works from the past by reading books, by interviewing people, talking to artists. Um, and all the information is out there. Yeah. I understand you're quite a peripatetic artist and that you've moved around the world, settling in different locations, but now you're based in South London. In fact, you live around the corner from where I oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I visited um, Hynek's studio a few weeks ago. And um, the paintings, as you see here, I think you'll get the impression there's a lot of inner turmoil, there's a lot of chaos here. But you might be surprised that the studio is immaculate. It's very tidy, very organised, all the brushes are beautifully arranged in on pots and the paint's very clearly laid out, nice computer in one, one, one corner, lovely coffee machine and sink. <laughs> but it's a lovely feeling of peace and harmony when you enter into the studio space. So it takes one back a bit when you actually start looking very closely at the paintings, because there seems to be all this existential angst um, going on. So I think it'd be quite interesting now for us just to talk about your practice sure. and how you actually set about painting, how you actually sort of work on a composition. So if we can go through this from beginning to end, so you can talk about the, the concept in your mind, if you work with models, how you select the models, how you pose them, how you draw from them, how you photograph them, and then how the work is, how it actually sort of evolves, the yeah. whole generative process from yeah. beginning to end. Sure. Uh, yeah, and, and about the, the tidiness and everything, it has to do with me being, like you said, in, in quite a turmoil from time to time. Uh, it's chaos up here. I need some, some tidy surroundings for it to, to not feel overwhelming. Uh, and I know how my brain works. I know if it's not manageable around me, I'll, uh, it, it, it'll spin out of control really quickly. So, uh, you know, I, I wake up every morning and I have small victories that I go by. Uh, I start the day off with you know, tidying off bed, uh, or waking up early, you know, all these things that might feel insignificant, but it makes you feel great in that moment in time and it, it balls uh, on itself until you actually get to the studio and you've already experienced a cascade of small victories. And that makes it easier to, to dive into something that's potentially really hard. Uh, you know, if, if you have a day of doing taxes, you know, you want to have everything lined up to that smooth transition into doing a very boring thing. Uh, I think you use the word victories. <laughs> um, I haven't come across that term. It's like a little ritual, but you call it victories. So you yeah. sort of tick boxes off, is it that? Or you feel you get yourself into a mental state. Yeah. Ready for... Yeah. Uh, and so um, for me, the moment it's untidy when I come into the studio, it's already, you know, 
I'm already lost and, and might take me two hours to clean it up. And then by the end of that, the half the day is gone and I've not been able to be as productive as, my, as I might want to. Uh, so <laughs> for me, it's a paramount to have some order in my life. Um, so yeah, and then when I do actually start painting, um, most of my work comes from um, based off photos that I have taken over, over the years. I uh, take a lot of photos, I have models coming in. Uh, if anyone here wants to model, please let me know, I'll, I'll take you guys in. Um, I take a lot of photos, photo manipulate them, uh, make, put them in uh, impossible positions, uh, and I use that as a ref reference for my work. Uh, nothing ends up looking anything like the photo. Um, uh, it's kind of just a, uh, a way of uh, exciting my uh, uh, compositional eye. So can I stop you, so just to get that mm. sort of clear in our minds, to so take this composition behind here, mm. so is that sort of amalgamated from a number of so the observation of the models in your studio yep. and then the photographs that you digitally manipulate? It's almost like a collage. A collage, yeah. so the bits, different, different part, fragmented body parts yeah. put together. Yeah, absolutely. That might explain why some of these limbs are in extraordinary um, positions. Yeah. Which yeah. no human being could possibly achieve. Yeah. As the uh, contortionist, perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely not uh, following the rules of, of physics always. Or anatomy. It's not really about that. It's about the the expressions. It's all always about uh, emotion and expression, and very little about uh, the the anatomy in these days. So I will go uh, forward on to um, to start painting, and it's changed a lot over the years. Over the last five years, I think I've um, the paintings might not look as different, but technically it's changed tremendously. So back in the days I would be very methodical um, about the painting process and it would yield some very good paintings, the results, but the actual process of it would be almost you know, static, dead. Uh, and I feel the current way of making works is just pure chaos and <laughs> uh, some of the paintings turns out awful, some works really well uh, beyond what I could imagine. So um, I've given up a little bit of control in my art making to accommodate some, some random results that, that sometimes works really well. Uh, and it's much more fun for me at the, in the moment in time whilst, whilst doing the, the pieces. Um, and sometimes it, it gets me some, some really fruitful results as well. Uh, it's been a journey. So with the, the, the paintings, do you, does the figure come first and then the background? Or do you work on the figure simultaneously? I work on everything at the same time. Same time um, yes. And in most of these paintings, I actually start out with, I paint everything in one day. And then I would manipulate the wet paint whilst it's on the canvas. I would spray, spray it with aerosols, terps, uh, and solvents. I would um, move it around with sponges and tissues, um, all kind of things that that makes uh, that dissolves the initial uh, painting. Then I would come back the next day and well, a couple of days and bring out some of the, the features that I enjoy, push something back if I don't enjoy it as much. Uh, so it's kind of a pull, push and pull. Um, and sometimes half the painting might, might have dripped off the canvas because of the solvents. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting con um, process that, that um, is different every time. I cannot control it and I love that. Uh, but so I have a lot yes. of control in my life in general. Yes, so. there's this tension in the work between the, the control and then this need for to let yourself go. Yeah. Um, mm. Give yourself over to the accidental. Yeah, you know. which is probably coinciding with the 
increase of control in my life. So it's uh, increasingly more tidy <laughs> because I'm yeah. letting go of control in the process of painting. Yeah. So I think that's what makes the, the paintings, I think, so visually compelling that you have with these, these sort of two aspects sort of, you know, um, sort of friction um, between them. Mm. Earlier on, when we were walking around the gallery, we were looking in particular at the paintings on this side here. Um, we see sort of, you know, some figures um, with the rips <coughs> in them. In fact, they've been burned. That's where the canvas has been burnt. And we started talking about the work of Edvard Munch, the great Norwegian artist, who obviously is relevant for you, for you being based, you know, brought up in, um, in Norway. Mm who would often leave his canvases outside, often in extreme weather conditions, often in the, often in the snow, because he felt it made them more, you, you put it in a way where it comes from. Yeah, so he called it uh, in Norwegian hestekud, which I well, it roughly translated it's uh, the horse treatment. And uh, uh, it has a, a different word in, in English, but all of his works were put out in the in the in the nature into uh, onto his balcony in Norwegian weather. It's pretty rough, snow, rain, sun, um, and it's to you know mimic life itself yeah. by also dying. Yes. And so the the people in Norway now trying to conserve these paintings are having a terrible time. It's about, it's about survival, isn't it? Yeah. Really, if you can su survive that, that, those conditions, <laughs> you will you, know, you will persist. You yeah. will um, um, continue. It's very interesting. So obviously, these um, um, paintings do present a challenge in the future. So I mean, if you you know you project it, things say fifty, a hundred years down the line, they're, they're, you could describe ones like a poppadom or something <laughs> on the pop, this poppadom like surface. It's going to present quite a challenge for conservatives. Or does that not bother you at all? No, not at all. Uh, it will be a problem and yeah. it will crackle and it will uh, dissolve little by little. It won't fully dissolve. Yeah. It's varnished yeah. and it's uh, preserved as, well, halted in its process as, as much as it can. Mm -hmm. But some pieces will absolutely fall off and yeah. uh, that's part of uh, what you get when you buy it. And yes. um, well, hopefully the collector or the person enjoying that piece of art will also enjoy the fact that it's not a static thing it will live on with you um, and and but i think fire has also been used as a preservative in yes. in certain cultures yes. uh, i think japanese are using some sort of burning of uh, outside of the of um, exterior of homes as a uh, a way to preserve um, uh, buildings yes. so might stay for even longer than these paintings. <laughs> Who knows? It's, it's, it's like existence, isn't it? Really? Yep. It's like open to chance. Yep. Um, I think it'd be interesting now just to think about you know, who's influenced your practice. You know, because um, I think it's quite interesting that you're looking at your art. It seems to sort of be quite sort of James' face. It looks to the past, you know, particularly with his emphasis on the nude sort of you know. People, when people write about your work, they often use this term neoclassicism, mm. but also I think you're keenly aware of contemporary culture. You use digital media a lot. You've talked about the influence of film and certain film directors yeah. on your practice. So I think you know, it'd be quite interesting to know about this, you know, the, the eclecticism and how you synthesize these different images yep. um, or influences and sources um, in sort of, you know, de developing your vision. Yeah, and I... I I mean, uh, it's a question you get quite often, and I've never really had a good uh, answer because it's it's so widespread. And and I would say that you know my first influences in art was more classical painting, neoclassicism, like you mentioned, romanticism, uh, William Bouguereau, uh, Sargent, all these academic artists that kind of got a little bit forgotten in. Impressionist time because that was the that is the the more uh, important one uh, later on in history, um, but this type of uh, the type of figuration and, um, and their way of describing skin and composition has has always appealed to me, um, but I would say that my main inspiration usually comes from outside of painting. I think I'm unable to really appreciate art as it should be. So if I go into, into any gallery, uh, I would look at composition and colors, brush strokes, uh, you know, things that aren't really 
essential with painting. I was like, wow, this is a beautiful painting. That composition is great. But the artist most likely did not want to speak about composition. You know, it's like I would marvel at somebody's poem because of the clever rhymes, but not think of the actual words. So many of the things that I look at or listen to is music and movies, uh, books, things that I don't know nothing about. I, I'm, I, I know nothing about any of those things. I don't know if it's a drum or a, a guitar, but I, can, but I feel it. And that's the important thing. So I want to go into any type of art and I will just, I want to lose myself and just feel as much as I can. So it's rarely paintings or drawings or, or classical two-dimensional art. That's, that's really interesting. Can you just sort of cite some of those literary influences on musical ones, which they, they sort of you know names which come from artists who come back to you, so writers I think, or filmmakers? I think um, one that always comes back is uh, David Lynch, um, Charlie Kaufman, uh, movie directors. Yes. That has a quite a whimsical way of uh, of, of uh, storytelling. It's uh, it's about the emotional content often, and not necessarily as based on the narratives, which is unusual for movies, which is usually very narrative based. So. So you'll have a little bit of mix of everything, something that, that you can recognize and then something that you, could, you should just feel uh, probably close to many, many artists and writers and, and directors that deal with magical realism as well. Um, so yeah, music is kind of anything. I, I like absolutely everything and anything and, uh, and goes through um, a very varied list of, of music during my day. It's a playlist for every occasion. So your, um, your art is new, you would describe it as being romantic, it's, it's ex expressive. Um, I think it's what I mentioned before, this sort of tension between the, sort of, you know, the, the technique you know, of your mastery of the technique and then this desire to actually destroy what you've um, created. There seems to be something very sort of cathartic going on. You want to sort of expand or expiate something, and you've often spoken before about your emotions and having to deal with that through your art. I wonder if we could say more about that. This might be sort of you know, encroaching on more sort of personal yeah. poetry and your sort of, you know, your sort of spiritual, artistic um, journey. Mm. No, absolutely, is very much a part of, of why I do this and um, this uh, this way of trying to find back to uh, an emotional side for me has always been the the essence of what I what I make and um, I've been I, I grew up as a very emotional kid I was you know cried all the time I was a you know any kid I fell in love all the time I was uh, emotional then certain things happened in my life and I kind of built up walls to protect myself. And uh, at some point I felt nothing. And it was great when bad things happened, not so great when good things happened. Uh, so essentially since I started painting 15 years ago, I've been trying to find back to emotions. And uh, so I, I dive into this whole universe of, uh, of, um, of things that might trigger any emotional response um, in my work. Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> I think you've actually answered it in a way of almost saying that your artist acts as a kind of therapy. I mean, a lot of artists do say this. They sort of, you know, find an answer through the process. Yeah, oh, yeah. The process is sort of he the healing, as, yeah. it, as it were. Yeah, so, yeah, with catharsis and everything, it's uh, it's things that I yeah, voluntarily dive into that aren't as pleasant uh, in order for me to yeah, just feel something and, and, uh, and to be able to get this darkness out of me makes me a somewhat normal person outside of my studio time. And without this, I would 
integrated in my life and I would probably not be a very pleasant person to be around. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's very important for me. I need to paint, it's, uh, it's what I do, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not always coming from a very light place. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about identity because you've told me you were born in South Korea, but you adopted as a baby, is that right? Yeah. And yeah. then brought up in Norway. So I wonder if that's something to do with it, you know, about roots, origins, identity. Or I mean... That, was that I, too deep or is it not relevant in your life at the moment? It might be. Yeah. I don't... I, I never really considered that to be a... a why I'm, I am as I am. Mm. I, I've lived a very sheltered, soft and, and safe life in, mm. in Norway with loving parents and siblings. Um, but I think anyone who goes through adoption or, or in any way is being given away by your biological parents mm. would have to deal with some sort of, of issue at some point yes. in life. Yeah. Uh, many of my friends who's been through the same has been dealing with it. I never felt like I've had a problem with it, but mm. I'm sure it reflects somehow through my art. Maybe. In interesting. Yeah. <laughs> see, see where it, it, it yeah. takes you. Um, I wanted to ask about sort of titles, and you've spoken about literary influences, and this exhibition is called Love in Exile. And I understand that sort of takes us back to the writings of Camus. Yeah, so um, like all of all the kind of existential dread and, and thoughts that I've had um, throughout life. Uh, these like Camus and Sartre are kind of the, the, the guys that are most accurately describing the problems that I have and a solution for it. And this exhibition is called uh, Love in Exile. Uh, it comes from, well, exile comes from um, an idea of Camus mentioning that the discrepancy in between uh, humans' search for meaning and the, the intrinsic lack of meaning in the universe creates a f creates the absurd. And the absurd will give you a feeling of being in exile. He was himself uh, Algerian um, and moved to, to France. Um, and he describes it as being in exile. So this exhibition is about um, finding, in one way I would say losing hope, uh, losing the hope that you know you'll be happy at the end of this you'll be you'll feel fulfillment or you you will find the the great meaning of life when once this has happened or this has happened stop thinking about that start enjoying the little things in life with the struggles with the hardships and just kind of enjoying the struggle so and that comes from his book uh, the myth of sisyphus where he says that you must imagine sisyphus happy sisyphus of course being the the king uh, doomed by the gods to roll a boulder up a hill forever um, and he claims that in between the, the boulder rolling down the hill he will realize that this existence is all there is for him he has nothing else, nothing to look forward to. This is uh, eternity for him. And now he can start enjoying the struggle, rolling that boulder up the hill, because there's nothing to hope for. Uh, and I think, so Camus claims that the hope for something better is what makes us unhappy. So, so the to do with acceptance, perhaps? Yeah. And being in the present? Being in the present. So love in exile for me is about yes enjoying everything there is about this ex existence, which is also the hardships and struggles and, and, and terrible times that we've you know, all have gone through during, during lockdown and, and you know, everyone experiences hardships and, and suffering. Uh, but accepting it and starting to almost enjoy it. So these things that I enjoy in life you know, being together with friends, family, uh, enjoying a drink, watching my football team lose, all these things. 
and you know take it in and this is all there is this is this is it uh, has been very meaningful to me so this ex exhibition is all about uh, this acceptance so I think what you're moving on to the, what, what you're experiencing very personally is also part of a sort of broader collective experience and perhaps it's through, through acknowledging the work of um, Camus um, and other existential writers it's part of the human condition so what you are experiencing can also be experienced by other people as well. And it's quite interesting you talk about the myth of Sisyphus as well, um, too. So obviously there's an understanding of myth. Um, looking at this exhibition, it reminds me of the chapel. It has a sort of, you know, the light, the low lighting, and the stations of the cross. I wonder, do, are you interested in mythology and religion? Does that come into your... Yeah, so I'm yeah. very into it. I'm not religious no, 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 or... Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. How it feeds I, uh, into your... Yeah, no, I, I think many of these things have been the greatest stories ever told and mm. they trigger many things in me that I admire mm. um, and I've always been searching for something bigger mm. never found it and, uh, and but I'm very fascinated by mythology and religion and, and all these things that has to do with with eternity and the bigger questions in life interesting one of the questions I wanted to ask just sort of you know before we open up to the um, the audience I'm, I'm aware that you have a large following on social media and a lot of the people who really admire your work and respond to it in a very sort of deep emotional way are young people. The people in their 20s and 30s who might be on a similar journey yeah. to, to, to you. And I wonder if you feel anything about you know, what your experience, your struggles, um, your, sort of, you know, your, your, your vision, is this taps into some kind of zeitgeist? I mean, you might say this has always been the case. Mm -hmm. People have always experienced feelings of suffering, fear, loneliness, anxiety. Yeah. But do you feel it's perhaps more urgent now than ever before? Maybe it's difficult for me to kind of talk about history whilst we're living in it. Yeah. But I think, um, I think definitely it's something that's coming back because we have all this time to reflect on, on, on these questions. I think the lockdown didn't help. Uh, I think many people sat at home and started thinking about what are they doing in life? Why are they working in a job that gives them no fulfillment? Why are they uh, together with this, this person? Why are they not happy? All these questions comes up. Um, and I think it's healthy for people to reflect on these things from time to time. And you think that explains this sense of empathy people have with you while they're drawn Possibly, yeah. to, your, to your work? Yeah, I and, think... And um, I, I understand that people have um, come into the gallery and respond very emotionally. Yeah. There have been accounts of people coming and being you know, visibly moved mm. by these encounters and yeah. the engagement with your work. And uh, it taps a deep chord in people. Yeah. Uh, I'm very honoured for, for people to feel something, you know, seeing my paintings. And I think it does strike a chord as, well, as the same way I would look at uh, the work of Camus and feel like it strikes a chord in me. Uh, and, um, and I think it's comforting knowing that there's people out there feeling the way that I do. Uh, and that's probably why I have this yeah. following. But um, yeah, that's... I would say it's what it's to do with the fact you, you do dissolve boundaries. So looking at the paintings, they're not framed in the conventional um, sense. Um, they take you in beyond the canvas and yeah. out of it as well. So it, they move in um, both directions. And I also like the way you, I admire the way you've displayed these without titles. I notice in the catalogue, which I'm going to show everyone on here, we just flick through, um, the paintings do have titles such as Hurt, Mesh, Grasp, Head, Coalesce. I just wanted to ask you how important are the titles, or do you just give them a title that you feel that has, you have to identify, distinguish one work from another? Uh, they're not at all important. <laughs> uh, in the beginning of my, pro, um, my early years of painting, I, everything was unnamed, untitled. Uh, I do it essentially as a way of making it a little bit more practical. Um, but it's not about the individual words. It's not about the individual pieces. This exhibition is uh, a, it's the full poem. One word in, it, in itself would make very little sense. So these individual words makes very little sense, um, 
but it, they come together as a, as a whole and hopefully it tells a story. Yes, but the love in exile, that's an important umbrella concept, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Wrap around everything. Absolutely. Okay, so I guess the final question I want to ask you is, well, what next? Where are you going on your journey? <laughs> I like into your studio. It's quite interesting because a lot of you know, the things here sort of almost dissolve, break down, go from figuration virtually into abstraction. And I did notice in the corner of your studio some small abstract compositions. I just wondered whether you're going to be, you'd be able to go break through the figure into something else or whether the figuration will always <coughs> be at the heart of what you do. I think, uh, well, first of all, I have no idea where it's going. Uh, <laughs> I, I had no idea this would, would happen either uh, a year ago. I think I want to explore everything there is that has to do with a pure and truthful expression. Uh, and medium, it's, it's just a, a limitation that you know, it's a, it's a comfort zone. I, I like art in all in all realms. I want to explore abstract art. I want to explore digital art. Uh, I want to collaborate with artificial artificial intelligence. I want to do everything. Um, we'll, we'll see where it goes. <laughs> We really look forward to um, seeing the next um, stage. I've um, got a lot of people here, and I'm sure many people want to ask questions, so please don't be shy. I think we've covered a lot of ground in this conversation, but I'm sure that you might have questions you're sort of burning to ask. Yeah, I was just wondering about the, if I'm using the right term, the disintegration of the figure. Did, how did it come about? Was it an incremental process, or were you, were you born into the disintegration of the figure? No, so absolutely come, has come uh, gradually. And um, I have some brilliant examples I can show you later on. Uh, it's about the dissolving of the self. So it's about me changing, me finding that I might not be the person that I thought I was. Uh, the ideals that I had, uh, it's, it's all, you know, comes, comes crumbling down. And for me, it felt like I, I needed to express uh, that change in a, a meaningful way. Uh, all the paintings in this room is uh, self-portraits in that sense. That's interesting, um, just come in, come in here. I wanted to ask, the question I wanted to ask about this, use this word portrait. I work at the National Portrait Gallery, where we <coughs> understand portrait to be a likeness, that it's a new representation of someone you can recognize who that person is it tells you something about their identity, position um, in society and um, um, culture. But um, these seem to be beyond portraits. Um, I think you've, on one occasion you said perhaps they're really self-portraits. Yeah. You paint something external, in all, which acts as a mirror to yeah. yourself and your own inner life. Yeah, very much so. Uh, it, they are portraits in a way. It's, you know, traditionally it's a figure on a piece of uh, canvas, but it's never about the person that I'm uh, that I'm painting. Never about likeness. Never about anatomy or beauty. It's about uh, the the mindscape and the emotions and the the atmospheres that I want to express at that moment in time. And that's just uh, uh, you know me reflecting myself on top of someone else's image. Uh, so no one in this room. Uh, the, the, depicted looks anything like the painting, and it's not supposed to. Okay. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, and the creative process, like you were saying about how you used uh, chemicals or um, things to dissolve the paintings, and especially the ones that you burnt, like, was it something you experimented with first, or was it just like, you just went with it? Um, I've had certain play days with a little bit of, uh, just to see if it is actually possible or not, but I've been pretty uh, spontaneous with, with some of these uh, experiments. So uh, I absolutely have some, some, some examples of, uh, of, of paintings that have been burnt or uh, played with solvents that didn't work at all. So <laughs> these are the ones that survived. <laughs> And the solvents would be to white spirit? White spirits, uh, terps, terps yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Anyone else? Yeah? Um, it looks to me that the figures are eluding some sort of inner light. Would you say that you, it just happened for them to, to be like that? That's like your moment of self-discovery, the moment of reincarnation almost in your artistic process, like you're rebirthing yourself? Oh, yeah. Well, absolutely. It's, um, you know, quite literally with the, the burned pieces, it's, uh, it's about uh, burning uh, the old and from the ashes of the old, uh, something new can grow. Uh, they, they might look a bit more brutal than, than they are. It's actually a very optimistic and, and light painting, <laughs> but it seems quite violent. But they, uh, they are all about self-growth, and this is possibly one of my uh, conceptually lightest exhibitions I've done. Paradoxically, yes. because it's a very dark exhibition. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's good. To, that's good to hear. And this relates to the idea of the acceptance. Yeah. Your, your um, stoicism and acceptance. Yeah. Any other? And uh, yeah, just a tiny follow-up. Would you say that uh, because the idea of coming uh, that there is no pretty much meaning in life, and hoping for something better is what makes us unhappy. Isn't that a little bit in you know in a discrepancy with religion and theology, which where people actually always dream of and aim at something bigger mm. and something better? Mm. How would you describe that you managed to combine those two ideas on the canvas? Well, so. Um... I think, I think the one of the solutions to to nihilism is religion. Um, but uh, if you are like I am, you're not able to accept something uh, just on on uh, just by the word. And uh, Camus described. Uh, religion as philosophical suicide. There's two, uh, three solutions to nihilism, and it's philo philosophical suicide, it's actual suicide, and it's uh, accepting the absurd. Um, so for me, this is. I, I, I wish I was religious. I wish uh, it would be great, but I can't. And uh, this is the only other solution that's viable. Uh, it seems to me. Any other observations, questions? Okay, I think everyone's overall watching <laughs> silence. Okay, well, I think um, we'll probably finish there now. Um, but um, I would encourage you to go down, perhaps start downstairs, would you say? Yeah, yeah. Go downstairs with the, some of you know, the white paintings, as I call them, and the paintings produced during lockdown, the small garage studies, mm. and then move up to sort of you know, the grand finale. Yep. Um, I'm here. Yeah. And have you, have, yeah. you'll be around to ask questions yeah. as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming. That's good. Yeah. So. Have a little walk. <laughs>